At General Jackson's camp, Davy and Major Russell told what had happened to Colonel Coffey, a white-haired fighting veteran of the Revolution. Well, Crockett, Major, that creek you killed probably belonged to the tribe camp somewhere on the Coosa River. If that's so, Colonel, we'd better get after him. They're not about to sit still very long before they try to join up with the bands here to Tallapoosa. And if that happens, there'll be more of them than we can handle. Has the general arrived with the new volunteers yet? He's on his way, but he won't be happy when he gets here. Not enough food to feed even the men you brought. Pardon me, Colonel, sir, but what's the food difficulty? No meat. We got flour, salt, and molasses, but no meat. That's so. What you need's a couple of hundred steaks, I reckon. Now, don't be funny, Crockett. We got trouble enough. Hardly being funny, Major. You just give me ten good shooting men for today and tomorrow, and trust my trigger finger. Davy got his ten men and marched them off mysteriously into the woods. The following day, General Andrew Jackson arrived at the camp with his army of Tennesseans, men more than willing to get after the Indians who had massacred the settlers at Fort Mims. All they wanted first was a good meal in their stomachs. These volunteers are hungry men, Colonel. It's taken us too long to get the powder and guns to start rolling. We were all right for that kind of thing, General, but we are possum poor on food. Well, I suggest you find a way to get rich quick, or... <laughs> the General never got a chance to finish. Coming into the far end of camp was a small parade of men, led by fifers and drummers. When they got closer, the officers could see it was Davy and his shooting men, all of them in coonskin caps and buckskin shirts. And hanging from a pole between every two men was a huge black bear. Who's that man, Colonel? One waving his cap. That's Davy Crockett, sir. First man to draw creek blood. Well, I do believe I heard of him. Scout Crockett, put that creature down a moment. Yes, sir. Happy to. At your service, General. You're the same Crockett I heard about further north. Tell me, is it true you killed your first bear when you were five? General, sir, someone's been bending your ear. Well, I was a grown-up man, about ten years old when I'd done that. So the small army had their bear steaks and slept well that night. But time was as much of an enemy as the creeks, and they were up before dawn, moving down towards the Coosa River. Davy had seen signs of heavy movement while he'd been out hunting, and he rode ahead with Colonel Coffey, trying to catch up with the Indians that had once raided the fort. They had no luck until a friendly Indian came to their camp and told them the Creeks had their headquarters not more than a day's ride away. It sounds like the real thing, Crockett. You ride on up ahead, and when you've got hold of something, let us know right quick. Davy did more than just ride ahead. He dismounted when he was near the Indian camp and crept in on foot until he could almost reach out and touch the dogs that guarded the camp. He reported back, and they waited until dark. Then the colonel ordered them all to lead their horses in single file until they were near enough to attack. Finally, Davy signaled that they should go no further, and the soldiers mounted in silence. Just ahead of them, between clumps of pine trees, they could see the rows of unsuspecting Indian huts. All the campfires were out, and the dogs were quiet. The entire camp was asleep. A pale moon shone in the sky above them, and all the birds and forest animals were silent. Colonel Coffey looked at the faces of the soldiers around him and raised his pistol for the signal. The 
Greeks never even had a chance to get to their horses. They used their bows and what rifles and muskets they had while standing on the ground. Davy galloped forward, fired, and saw one fall. Then he turned his weapon around, held it by the barrel, and used it as a club, swinging left and right and knocking down one creek after another. Here and there, a soldier toppled from his horse as an enemy bullet or arrow found its mark. But the Indians suffered far worse, and they dropped everywhere. In less than 15 minutes, it was over. The Creeks that hadn't been killed were rounded up and taken prisoner. It was a complete victory for the volunteers, and the massacre at Fort Mims had been avenged. Much later, when the campaign was over, Davy had a chance to talk about it to his neighbors and wife at home. And that was just the first of it. We whooped them again at the Talladega, where I got this tomahawk scar. Mm -hmm. And then on the Tallapoosa. That was a closer one, that was, because they caught us in the middle of the river. But old Hickory Jackson, he used his cannon from the far shore, and we whooped them again. Oh, Dave, you ought to thank your stars. You're all of a piece. Why, Polly, it'd be that much better if they knocked me in half. Then there'd be two of me, and I'd take care of twice as many creeks. <laughs> <laughs> But Davy hadn't had enough of taking chances. He moved his family again, this time to the wild region of the Obion River in western Tennessee. It was a land full of still larger bears, beaver, otter, wild geese, and giant turtles. He set up a small mill, taught his boys all he knew about hunting, and even tried his hand at moving timber down the big Mississippi. By this time, the army had promoted him to colonel and he even decided to run for Congress in Washington. Well, folks, y'all heard my two opponents give their speeches, but I ain't gonna make any fuss. I got my promises all sewed up in a fat alligator hide at home if anybody wants to drop around and take a look. Why, if I had it my way, I'd get the whole national capital shifted right down on the banks of the Oberon in West Tennessee. <laughs> I saw my old friend, Mirabelle Chicken, walking around the hen coop. And I often said to her, Miss Mirabelle, who are you voting for in this old election? And she said, Crockett, Crockett. <laughs> so Davy Crockett went to Congress. And when he served out one term, they elected him for another. It was quite a thing to see. Davy standing up to talk in the Capitol building, wearing his buckskin shirt and holding his coonskin cap under his arm. He wasn't a man to hold a grudge, either. When the Indians had been soundly defeated and it came time to divide up the public land, he fought hard to give them a share of what had belonged to them in the first place. Gentlemen, it's one thing for you all to sit around here in this nice white building and talk about Indians like they were possums. But they ain't. They're men like you and me. The Creeks and Cherokees and other eastern tribes are used to living in villages. Move them out to the west like you want to, and they'd be killed off by roving tribes. Tribes like the Pawnees and the Sioux. Boy, I'd rather be an old coon dog belonging to a poor man in the woods. That was Davy in Washington. To a party that won't do justice. But when his second term was over, he just went back to the Obion and became a bear hunter again. Then, in 1835, he heard a lot of talk about the new territory people called the Texas. It was supposed to be a big open country, farther across than a man could ride in a month of steady travel. At that time, it was ruled by Mexico, but General Sam Houston, who had fought the Creeks and also served as governor of Tennessee, declared he was about to fight for the independence of the Americans settled there. His appeal, along with that of Sam Austin, reached Davy's ears, and it wasn't long before he was traveling towards the small town of San Antonio. Along the way, being as famous as he was, he picked up a good many friends. You, sir. I say, aren't you Mr. Colonel Crockett? The very one. And 
from the look of your frills and coattails, mister, I'd say you were a gambler. That I am, Colonel. But rather a good shot as well. I dare say I could knock the crown off the King of Diamonds at 50 paces. And you there, son. What's your living? I'm just a bee hunter, Colonel. I get the honey from their nests. But I can hunt Mexicans, too. Well, gentlemen, if you can fight as good as you talk, it won't be long for the Texas is free as the wind. Along the way, they shot buffalo for food and picked up two more men, a pirate who had once sailed with Jean Lafitte and an old, old Indian who knew the different ways of the wide open land before them. Together, they rode to San Antonio and finally came to the gates of an old mission used as a fort, a place called the Alamo. Waiting for them was Colonel Jim Bowie from Arkansas, the famous scout who had developed the two-sided knife blade. We've been on the lookout for you all week, Davy. Hey, you Texas, turn up for David Crockett. Now, before you go celebrating, Colonel, you better tell me what your troubles are. I hear you got a heap. You heard right, Davy. Santana, the Mexican general, is marching to invade the Texas with several thousand men. Several thousand, you say? How extraordinary. You don't look like you got too many here, that's for sure. 120 before you arrived. Well, you got 125 now. <laughs> general Houston is getting an army ready north of here, but this is our first defense against the Mexicans. If we can give them a week more to get ready. Why, sir, we'll give them two weeks. And the only way to do it is to get real wild and hold this fort. You've got it figured. Gentlemen, I'm wild already. Let's hold this here Alamo. For the next four days, the volunteers inside the Alamo got ready. They cleaned and recleaned their rifles, readied the cannon, got in more supplies, and cheered each other with stories and songs. 31 more soldiers arrived to fight, and that brought their number to 156. On the morning of February 22nd, 1836, the guards along the top of the Alamo's walls saw the first of the enemy army approaching. Well, Davy, Looks like there's a pack of them all right. A whole lot more than we can whip. Right you are, Colonel. We can hold them for a while, and that's what we're here for. Let's hear those cannon. The Americans fired their first salvo, and then another being careful to find a good target since their supply of cannonballs was low. The young beekeeper sang songs. The old Indian took his turn shooting from the top of the walls. The pirate served on the cannon, and the gambler took more chances than he ever had in a card game. But as the days of fighting wore on, the enemy used more and more men. They charged the fort repeatedly and opened fire at close range, while the men inside picked them off and ran out of ammunition. Finally, on the twelfth day, there was scarcely a bullet left inside the fort, and the final Mexican charge was successful. They threw up ladders against the walls and climbed over. Davy and his men fought with knives and fists and gun butts, but the numbers were far too great, and somewhere in the fire and smoke, Davy Crockett died. But the 12 days had given General Houston enough time to get his Texans ready. And it wasn't very long before he swept down from the north and destroyed the entire Mexican army. Their battle cry was, remember the Alamo. And many a man among them remembered the incredible hero in a coonskin cap who had given his life so Texas would be free. Bear hunter, Indian scout, congressman, and pioneer Davy Crockett's great legend was just beginning. Round and round I say. Wow. 
Round and round, old Joe Clark. Goodbye, Billy Brown. Round and round, old Joe Clark.